I've been fucking up Android since at least 2011 because I think it's one of the platforms that deserve to be fucked up. And I, I think it both in a positive and negative way. And what I'm going to talk about now is not exploiting the system itself, but the actual applications running on the system, which are not using the facilities provided by the operating system, namely Android, uh, in a perfect way. Because we all know that system developers can do really sophisticated protection methods, and then application developers can defeat all those protections if done preparedly. Uh, this slide must be in every Android-related presentation, and you've probably seen it a few times. Uh, well, I think many of you know that Android has a Linux kernel, which is a little bit different from standard GNU Linux distributions, uh, that it has this Binder IPC driver, which is an in-kernel uh, inter-process communication uh, facility, and it can be used to exchange data between Android processes. Why would you exchange data between processes? Because users generally like the idea of uh, sharing photos from their albums by clicking a button and it appearing in the Facebook or Twitter application, <laughs> or for better users, it appearing in the application that can mask users' faces so that a protest image can be posted without exposing the identities of the people actually at the protest. But the, uh, why do you need such uh, complicated methods? Well, uh, I have an Android device running here, and I didn't want to start that application. Uh, this is an Android emulator, and the Android emulators are really great because they present you a real running system, not just some kind of simulation like with iOS. And you can actually have a root access without any kind of hacking. So I can list all the devices connected using the ADB, the Android Debug Bridge. And if I specify which device I want to use, actually you can recognize what the emulator is. The other is the tablet here. And I say shell. I'm going to get a nice root shell. Uh, yeah, it's big hacking. Yeah, I rooted it. Let's release a jailbreak, but only for the pink iOS devices. <laughs> and, uh, and what we can do here is look at the data where the applications are stored, data slash data. And what we see is uh, maybe those of you who have already explored the Android system know that every Android application is assigned a different uh, user ID uh, as in terms of user ID of a Linux system. So although a device may be single user, but all the applications have different UIDs in order to isolate applications, although this is based on the speculation that the kernel can provide adequate, uh, adequate protect protection against such attacks, but we'll prefer it this way uh, during this talk. Uh, you can see that A44 means application 44, and U0 is added because this is a uh, Android 4.2 operating system, which can handle more users, for example, in case of tablets. So now it's even mixed up so that if I install an application and start using it and another using it, user starts using it, then they get two different UIDs so they can be all accessed uh, independently of each other. And because of this, you need some kind of IPC that where the kernel acts as a trusted third party that can be used to pass data from one application to the other. And uh, Android has many, many uh, such IPC facilities. There is one which I'd like to present to you, and it's called Content Providers. I copy-pasted this from the Android Developer's Guide. And basically, Content Provider, uh, I mean, the the important thing is that it's structured, so they provide you a structure to share your data so that any other application can present it. You know, it's like XML, but without all the bloatedness. And, and since it provides a standard interface, you can uh, query a content provider without a prior knowledge of the application. The problem is that uh, just like with uh, with uh, TCP, open TCP ports without firewalls, uh, if developers don't protect these uh, entry points into their application, then they are a recipe for disaster. 
the tool I'm going to use to uh, detect such content providers is Drozer, which was called Mer Mercury just weeks ago. Apparently, the guys renamed it. So if you find on the internet any kind of guide that says, we're going to use Mercury, then just replace it with Drozer. Uh, it is developed by the great MWR guys, MWR Info Security. And it's like Metasploit for Android. And you deploy an agent to the phone, and then you connect to that agent through the network, send uh, queries, and receive responses. It works really great. And I highlighted what's really great for us. It can detect content providers. It can give you a shell without actually using uh, ADB, because ADB requires a really intimate connection to the device, because it has implications. On the other hand, uh, Drozer only requires a network connection. It uses standard TCP. And the great thing is that with this attack surf, with this definition of attack surface, it can narrow the findings so you have less false positives, so you can concentrate what apps are actually breakable with this tool. And our first victim will be called Seismic. It's a social media app, but I, I know that's not, not trendy enough. It's so 2010. And uh, you, you, what you can already see is the actual exploit I created. And I'm going to demonstrate how to break it. Uh, of course, the developers have been notified by me several times. And after being really naughty with them, they finally released the fixed version. So you cannot exploit the up-to-date version using this method I'm going to show you. So we have this really beautiful application here. I clicked again into something I shouldn't have and I open up the Seismic, you can see the really great uh, Zeta Camp, who is a girl named Vuser and was registered for the purpose of this presentation. She has a Facebook profile, and she entered it into this great application. There is already one guy who accepted the friend request of a non-existent female user. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think that that in itself tells you something about male Facebook users. <laughs> uh, maybe there are more. It, it was like a, a half an hour after creating the user. So I, I don't have any further data because I don't have an uplink right now. But yeah, it's, it's really nice. And what I'm going to show you now is uh, using this browser tool. And I'm going to have to put it like this. So, uh, I'm going to start the Drozer agent, which will listen on the device. Uh, by default, it listens on this beautiful port. I'm not sure if you saw it, but you'll see it. Come on. Okay. So, it started at uh, 31415. I hope you all recognize the number. Although, Stefan would say that he prefers Tau. Uh, maybe some of you know his mania. And now I can connect to it by, uh, first of all, it's running on a different machine. If it would have a discrete internet connection, it wouldn't be a problem. The problem is that it's running in a QMU. It's one of those virtual machines. So I have to forward it because it uses a netted internet connection. So I say ADB devices. And then I say, uh, well, let's check out if someone is listening. I uh, see. Yeah, I already forwarded it using ADB. So you can use ADB to forward ports so you can make uh, connections. And if I start Drozer console uh, connect, you don't even have to specify local host because that's the default. But for example, if you're in a local network, uh, you can just specify the IP address and the port and it will work. And it doesn't work. That's what I love about it. Uh, just a second. That's what the demo effect is all about. So, if I would like to... Uh -huh. Yeah, I like it. Um, what's on that freaking port? Okay, let's kill it. Yeah, it's now starting again, but... And this is how you forward, yeah. I have to specify what I'm going to use. And that's the device ID. Uh, 
and now I shall connect to it without any problems. Woo! Yeah, it even has the same SQR style that the, uh, the Metasploit, and then I can say alas, and it lists all the, all the uh, different modules which are organized in namespaces, so if I say CD app, then it only lists uh, the modules within the app namespace. And right now what I'm interested in is provider, and from that I'm interested in, not provider, but scanner, yeah. I can scan for uh, injection or SQL tables, and that's what I'm interested in. Although you can use any scanner because it, you, it just runs through all your uh, applications, and since this, since this browser runs as any other application, so it doesn't require you to root your device. Uh, you, if, if browser can read something out of an application, any other application can do it. So it really provides you with, uh, with a realistic image. And let's see what it requires, because they like changing it. And now, yeah, you can just run it, and it will scan all your little applications, which would take forever. So now I can just say that com.seismic, which is the name of the seismic application. This is the attack surface I've already told you. This, well, that doesn't return very well. Okay, attack surface, how should I run it? I hate it. Okay, this one requires its argument without an A. Okay. It says it, it exports one content providers, which is sound, sounds amazing. It, it could also say export services and broadcast receivers, but those are two other attack surfaces which requires yet another talk. And then I could just say app uh, provider info, yeah. I like consistent interfaces. It helps so much. Okay, minus a com seismic. Okay, and it's it says that there are uh, there are three different uh, authorities which can access this uh, um, file, and we can. Th I mean, this kind of content provider behaves like a SQL table, so you can. Uh, do selects, do inserts, and uh, for that we would like to know what kind of columns does it have, and that's what we use the columns command for. And for that we need to find the URI, sorry. Start scanning, whoa, we like this. I mean, it really sounds fun. And I think what we should be interested in is, for example, uh, as you've seen, we have a Facebook uh, thingy attached. But, 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 but. Facebook friends. Do you see Facebook? Facebook people. That sounds great. So, columns. And I just copy paste this. Oh, wow. Nice columns. And. Without showing you uh, any more boring comments, I'm going to show you the proof of concept application I created for the people at Seismic to demonstrate my uh, problems with this application. I called it Copra League because it leaks uh, content provider data. And you can see how easy it is, it is to read, for example, the Seismic friend list, the list of all friends I have. You just have to know the uh, URL, as you see before, you just have to find those. The application listed them. You see these are the same content URLs. 
you have to know what columns you're interested in and then you can just say that you query the, U the URI you want, the projection is what columns you'd like, the selection is the where, and yada yada yada. And then I just put it into a simple list and when exploited it looks like this. I quit and I just open this Coproleak application and click on friends. And oh, I have friends. It's really nice. And y you might think that, okay, when I installed this application, it may have required some authentication. Uh, and also, you may say that friends list is not that important. Okay, I have an accounts list where you have the authentication token, which I acquired from Facebook. So you can use it to impersonate the application. And so one example of exploiting this whole would be uh, you know, presenting a game to, to someone who is the social media manager for a big corporation. He installs it on his uh, phone and then this malicious apps, app gets the authentication token and starts posting nasty things on the company Facebook page, which some say is even worse than posting it on the home page. Oh, change the password process. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> and I can show you that Coproleak apps, what kind of permissions did that Coproleak, uh, Coproleak really requires, and download it, yes, that's what I'm looking for. Seismic, not seismic. Um, sorry, Coproleak is there. And it requires no additional I mean, uh, I show you another to, to have a comparison. So for, for example, the browser agent says that it requires the following permissions, full network access. But it requires no permissions, so it can be ejected into any kind of application. It can be a game. So uh, I think I have it on the slides, yeah. If you try to install it, you will see that it will get access to an empty list. Or if you look at it in the Play Store, it would display these applications require no special permissions. So, it, because it's, it's designed to be public. It's totally safe. It, of, of course it's totally safe. And you can see here an actual friends list and the Twitter and Facebook account uh, tokens for, for example, the Hackerspace Budapest uh, account. So, it's really nice. And fortunately, they, they, they fixed this problem, but as, as you can see, it's really easy to discover such applications because you just have to run it through browser and then you just, you just query it because the system is designed so that these resources are easily ac uh, accessible. So, well, thank God it's so easily accessible. Now, our next victim is the MWR B-size challenge because the MWR guys who developed this uh, this application that Drozer or Mercury, they, they designed a challenge uh, in which you had to download an application and it was, I hate clicking into this window, it was called uh, Evil Planner and you had to enter a pin, for example, let it be uh, 1337 because it's so elite and you could use it to plan your evil actions. So for example, I could put up a note Notes, okay, add the note. It's like uh, cam zero. Let's do something really evil at cam zero. Save. Note saved. And then I just go back, I have a note here, and it says let's do something really evil. You, you get the idea, it's a really simple app, and since it requires a pin, it must be secure. Well, if we go from the root shell just to discover it, uh, so I type not here and not there, but there. ADB shell minus s emulator 5054. Wasn't it that? 5554. I love this. And I take a look at the slash data slash data section. Here we have the browser 
And what we are looking for is the evil planner, maybe it's, oh, come example b size challenge. So if we take a look at it, the b-size challenge folder, then you can see that, unfortunately, even though everyone could come in here, so the directory is accessible uh, for other applications, if I go into the databases, it has an evil planner DB which is only readable and writable to the user ID and the group of the application. So, in theory, if this application would have no further interfaces, its data can only be read if you can uh, bypass the Linux kernel's uh, isolation. Well, fortunately for us, you don't need to go into much trouble doing that, because uh, if I exit this shell and uh, call Drowser again, I can just uh, use another scanner and this is for the other kind of uh, content providers. It's called Traversal because, as I said, content providers can be used to share uh, table-based data. So you have columns and you have rows describing values in those columns. But there's another kind of content provider where you can share files. So for example, you have a photo sharing application and you can share uh, the JPEG files using a standardized protocol, the content provider. And you can run this, I mean, uh, in the web world, you know that if you let people access file names, you're gonna have directory traversal problems, so you need to, well, some people say sanitize your input, I would rather say filter your input. And uh, this traversal plugin just checks it, and it's beautiful, you have to give, of course, the yeah, by default it runs on all applications, but that would be really slow, so I say come seismic filter, and then it just runs, runs, runs. Wait for it. Yeah, you're right. It would have been really uh, fascinating if it would have found something in the seismic that I haven't found before. Yeah, it starts scanning, and... Voila! It has vulnerable providers called local file. And I don't know why they did something like that, but okay, let's take a look at it. Uh, for, as I said, we are going to use some other tools. Dex to jar can be used to convert the Android executable into a jar file because. Uh, they are both compiled from Java, but they have different structure because of the different VMs, but we already have plenty of tools to analyze jar files, so that's what we should be using. So I shall go to TMP, uh, MV, yeah, Android project at APK. That's the APK file, and if I extract it because it's just a zip file, there's that classes.dex file. <coughs> And I could just dex to jar that by, yep, that's how it works. It runs, it, sometimes it puts out some warnings, sometimes not, and there I have a jar file, and if I list the contents, because jar file, jars are also zip files, I can see that, okay, it has a bunch of jar files. And the other tool I'm gonna use is GD, JDGUI, which is a Java decompiler with a graphical user interface. And, well, it's, it's, I think, one of the easiest way to interact with such files. And let's see an empty desktop here. I don't know how much you can see, but, uh, Okay, the problem is that I cannot set the font, it's a Java application, of course, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, for example, if I go into the login class, I can see that it uses some pin file. So by default, if you don't use any obfuscation or strip your Java files, it's gonna leak, for example, uh, variable names which do not have any, any place in a production environment, but well, sorry. If you move to scale, then 
space. Yeah, but it will be named like C and B and A. But yeah, but you know that's what defense in depth should be all about: uh, making the attacker's position problematic. And you can see that it, it asks for four digits, and then what the hell is it doing? It, it asks get system service phone, and then it gets a telephony manager, and then encrypt, uses the encrypt pin call. Yeah, that sounds really great. Encryption is always awesome. It says it has a pin length four, and it somehow tries to XOR something, okay. What does it XOR it with? Okay, get device ID. And if you look up, well, you can, we could have just looked it up if we had internet connection, but we don't. Uh, it gives you the uh, IMEI uh, identifier of the phone, which the emulator doesn't have, so it will require just zero bytes, but okay. The problem is that it just XORs the pin number with this uh, uh, identifier number, and then uses some kind of hash generator too, but we just don't care. We can copy and paste the code from here that we redo the process. So even though if I go back and, uh, well, first of all, uh, yeah, adb shell slash ash emulator 5554. I can still don't remember why it requires such such order, but okay, cd slash data data slash com dot uh, example, the b size challenge, great, cd database is even greater, so if I cut this file, it's, it looks like it, it's, it's a SQLite, da uh, SQLite database, but all the values are obfuscated, so it's like base64 or something like that. So we could access it, but, but we'd have problems decoding those values. But since, uh, since the pin number is stored in the creds txt, so if I just go here and see the files, and it has this creds txt, which have this, what kind? Thing that could be okay. Base sixty four minus D. Do you see a pattern here? <laughs> so since, as I've already mentioned, it's not a physical phone. It doesn't have an identifier number, so it's all zeros. And if you source something with zero, it's changed. It's nothing. So. And there we have the pin number stored four times, maybe because it's, uh, it's you know, quad, quadruple secure. And, uh, <laughs> you know, our product is four times secure as the competitors. And uh, this way I can just read all the files and I can show you what, what I submitted as a solution. Uh, da, 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 da. So that if we could read the database file, we could decipher it. We know it, right? So if I say, yeah, solution, SRC, blah, 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 blah. Oh, because I tried to CD here, but we should use Vim. So I, I, I just copied it like, like, like vanilla, so I haven't even changed anything, and it could decipher it, but I still need to access the file, and okay, Drozer showed us that it's vulnerable. How can we abuse this? Well, it's, it's, it's real like with the uh, web, we just have to use the correct method, so I think we have uh, app dot, uh, provider dot, uh, dot, 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 dot download, and what it requires is to have the vulnerable provider, and okay, I can just copy it like this. So run a download or output. One of the, the first is, well, let's just put a few dot dot slash dot dot slash because, you know, if you issue a dot dot in the root directory, you still get the root directory, so it's like an opsled. And I say, yeah, uh, prots version, and TMP, Cam zero. 
Okay, and then I say, oh, wow, okay, we have the press version, so we can read anything, and then it's just a matter of decoding it. And of course, I, I also have a proof of concept application here. Uh, I just cannot see where it is. Maybe it's, it hasn't been installed, so I can see how to install an application. Okay, let's see it. ADB install solution debug. Have I ever mentioned I love the order of arguments? <laughs> okay, now it's installing. Um, we say besides proof of concept, and it displays the pin and the, all the notes I've put into the file, so it's pound officially. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> thanks. Unfortunately, lots of other people have attended this this uh, contest, and there were there was no clear evidence where to send the submissions. So they said that they received a numerous great. Uh, uh, solutions. So I didn't get any prize, but at least they 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 said that they are going to send me a T-shirt. But the problem is that in Hungary the postal service has a little bit of packet loss. So <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, it was like two or three months ago. So maybe I will get that package once. But but you know, the hope is decreasing every day. Yeah, yeah. You may never know what kind of postman would try to uh, hack Android systems. <laughs> wow. The, maybe they are collectors. We are small postman. Yeah. <laughs> and here's this unnamed email application, which I will not name because they. They are cooperative, and they are in the. They are trying to fix the problem, and I don't want sh to tell you uh, which application it is. It runs on this unnamed Android device. It is the default email client. So, well, the problem is that I think many people will use the default email client because why wouldn't they use it? And the problem is that. The, the original Android email client doesn't have this issue, so the device vendor put this vector inside. So if you want to believe in conspiracies and postnode, then it would not be a big problem if you believed in them. It might be intentional, so you may never know. And it can be accessed in the same way. We will just use Drozer again. It's just that I'm going to have to kill this freaking emulator so that the only device connected will be this. So if I say uh, ADB devices, I only see one device. That's really great. I see if someone is holding that port again before. Oh, it doesn't. Great. And now I just forward the TCP to this device. And I can use Drozer again. Oh, it's not started. Maybe that's why it won't allow me to connect. Okay, we enable it. Although you cannot see it because it's on the screen, but I'm trying to enable it. Oh, it's enabled. Great. And I can finally connect to it. And this time I try to do the same thing as scanning for traversal. This time I say com uh, dot android dot email. Scanning. Uh, it shouldn't find anything. It's part of the base system. <laughs> I mean, why would you have a f something called file provider which can access any file? I mean, I, I okay. So, well, uh, l let's hope that this time it won't work. So let's call it email and say, that, okay, it probably won't work. Why, why would it work? I, I mean, there's no way it could work. Um, Whoops. And the, the worst thing is that uh, since I can access anything that's owned by this email application, I can access the SQLite uh, 
database. So if I start draw it at screen, which is really great because it uses the screenshot protocol. So you can see the screen of the device. No, try another. Yeah. Okay. I don't know how well you can see it. Okay, and there is this beautiful SS logo with my company. I start it and, well, whoopsie daisy. Yeah, it lists all the beautiful things, like I added a test mailbox and it has all the login and the password information in clear text, so now, <laughs> It can access all the messages, and not just that, since it's a, it's a thick client, it can also access all the mails that are actually cached on the client. So even if it doesn't have any network connections, yeah. So we, we really like this stuff. So in conclusion, because it's already uh, half past eight, well, if you're, if you're an Android developer and you'd like to create more secure applications, then first of all, there is an exported flag. If you set it to false, no other applications can use this. I mean, okay, many teams develop one single big application, although I hate big applications, and you want to, want to share data with modules, okay, you can use content providers, just set it exported to false. Why would you want to share it with anybody else? Okay, you have multiple ac applications, you cannot use exported equals false. Okay, you can still share it if you set protection level, there's a switch called that. If you set it to signature, then only the applications that are signed by the same code signing key can access the content provider, so your applications can automatically access each other, but but if you use other applications, they won't. I mean, the system tries to guarantee it. And if you still have to share it with applications that are signed with other keys, then you can use special permissions. So when the user installs the application, uh, it will ask for, do you allow these applications to access all the attachments of your emails or something like that? So you can still use that, but I would, Rather say that don't use content providers at all if you don't really need it. So, you know, uh, security by isolation works really, really well. So, I, I would I would say that if any one of you ever wants to develop stuff like this, uh, use this, uh, these these uh, advices. And if you're a hacker, uh, install Drowser and start exploring because there are so much pre-installed crap on consumer devices that it's just waiting for you to explore it and, well, you can maybe get profit out of it. So, well, thanks for listening to me. <laughs> Questions? Why do people use the uh, question is, why do people use Android? Um, well, maybe because it still provides much, much, much more isolation than a GNU Linux system. Both the GNU Linux model of running everything under the same user, or having the assumption that if I run it uh, under multiple users but sharing the same X11 screen, uh, no, it doesn't provide any kind of uh, isolation. So it's. Well, I think it still offers better isolation, and I think this model should be improved really, really. Because if you look at it, it's not Android that broke the applications. The application developer themselves offered interfaces. So, you know, it's like the system cannot protect everyone, and I think that was also the message of Pavel's talk, which is also great, by the way. So, you just cannot prevent people from shooting themselves in the foot. Even, even if, if you just search for Google Android security, the first, one of the first uh, results is the actual Google Android Developers Guide security section, which says, don't use content providers. If you must use it, disable access to it. So developers just don't read the fucking manual. But I think that has been a problem since computer science exists. So. I think that's not something that these operating systems will ever solve. You yeah, you cannot fix stupid. Uh, <laughs> yes, Google still have access to all our files. Yeah. That's good, you can ask for backup. <laughs>
No, they forwarded to the NSA and they... And the, the NSA they, also they don't, have backup. But they don't respond to backup to, to this story. This is just like death knowledge. <laughs> Uh, you just have to ask it in a freedom of information request. But they don't give it to me. I think you are asking the, the wrong way. If you pose like a government official from the US, I don't know, State Department, oh. I'm sure they would give you the, the data. Yeah. Or if you would say, I'm from Boeing, you would get the data. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, well. I'm going to go outside with all of you so you can ask uh, any questions face to face with a beer. So, well, Let's have fun. Drink. Yeah.